ladies and gentlemen, uh, firstly, can I say what an absolute pleasure it is to come to this very well regarded summer school for the first time, and in fact it's my first time in Clenties as well. So I thank you for the very kind invitation to come along and speak to you, and I commend all of the team. I know from being behind the scenes for many, many years just how much work it takes to pull these types of things together. So I commend all of the team, and in particular, Dr. Joe Mulholland deserves a special mention for his dedication to the school over the years and his efforts to ensure that the school makes a significant and continues to make a significant contribution to the public policy debate in these islands and across these islands every year. Political discourse over the last number of years has been about Brexit, Brexit and more Brexit. And unfortunately, it does look like that will continue for the next short while. As a Democratic Unionist MP, our red line in the negotiations has been well publicised. We don't want to see any new border down the Irish Sea which would impede trade between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. However, a, well, a less well-publicised element of our position has been that we don't want to see a hard border uh, on the island of Ireland. I'm very conscious and I um, note the very positive comments about the discussion on the panel earlier on today. And uh, perhaps one of the biggest disadvantages to coming along is that we didn't get to hear that panel. So I don't know whether some of the observations and comments and arguments that I am going to make have already been devastatingly destroyed by the panel, but I'm going to make them uh, anyway. Uh, in addition, I'm very aware that I really only have 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, I know from my short time thus far in the Houses of Commons, in this very much a Brexit Parliament, uh, and sitting on the International Trade Select Committee, just how much detail, uh, how much information, how many different angles and issues and nuances need to be discussed. And there's no way that I can do justice to canter through that uh, here this evening. However, what I want to do is perhaps to draw attention to a number of issues by way of observations. I hope that uh, you will take my observations in the spirit in which they are intended. I know that uh, all of you will not agree with me uh, and agree with everything that I have to say. And in fact, I suspect that perhaps none of you will agree with some of what I have to say. But nevertheless, I think it is important to our debate, not only across Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, but also across uh, the United Kingdom and Ireland to understand each other's arguments to understand better where we are coming from, and perhaps in my observations and comments, to give a little bit more insight into uh, our position. We want to see a sensible border which works for Northern Ireland, the United Kingdom, the European Union, and yes, for our nearest neighbour, the Republic of Ireland. For the purposes of this discussion, I want to approach the question by bringing into it uh, over uh, 10 years of my experience of working at the heart uh, of government in Northern Ireland, particularly through the devolution in 2007. I worked as a special advisor to the First Minister from just before devolution in, in May of 2007. And I particularly want to touch on this because of my experience of in a very practical way working with the Belfast Agreement and the St Andrews uh, Agreement. And it does strike me that perhaps I do approach it in a slightly different way because my experience has been that very practical setting the rules of engagement and the parameters, particularly as through from 2007, we grew our relationship uh, with the Republic of Ireland, I think to the mutual benefit of both of our jurisdictions. In many of the discussions on Brexit, I have been deeply concerned by the erroneous and misuse of those agreements to support arguments and at times to make life difficult for the United Kingdom. I have been surprised as a barrister, uh, as a lawyer, I look at this as a legal document as it is. I look at what it says and importantly what it does not say. And I want to touch on that very briefly as well. Over recent times, there have been those who have attempted to say, and we've just heard it here tonight, that the DUP secretly want a hard border, alleging that this in some way better meets our tactical and strategic political objectives. This is, of course, untrue. In fact, it makes no sense at all for the DUP to desire in any way 
to damage the economic prosperity and continued growth of Northern Ireland through the establishment or re-establishment of a hard border. I want a strong and thriving Northern Ireland, a place where people are happy, healthy and content. Regardless of national or cultural identity, political affiliation or aspiration. That, I believe for any politician, is an objective worthy in its own right, based on our desire to support all to live the very best lives that they can. However, in addition, I recognise that it is in fulfilling that vision, that vision that will continue to ensure the stability of Northern Ireland and its continued existence. It is that vision and the fulfilment of that vision that will mean the strongest possible future of our United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland that I love so much. And this must mean that people are not and do not feel disadvantaged. This must mean that our Northern Ireland economy continues to grow, that it is given the necessary support and the economic environment to thrive. It must mean the continued investment in our infrastructure and public services, improving the quality of life for all of our citizens. That is the vision that I am committed to. That is a vision that is not compatible with the reinstatement of a hard border or the borders of our past. I do not believe that a hard border would be good for Northern Ireland. I do not believe that a hard border would enable the economic growth that we want and need to see. I do not believe, importantly, that a hard border would help or support our citizens in Northern Ireland to feel fully contented within Northern Ireland, within the United Kingdom. Over the course of the dark days of the Troubles, there were many, many border communities that lived day in and day out with the border the border infrastructure, the security issues and the implications of that. Although I don't live at the border, as indicated uh, already here tonight, I did grow up at the border until I was 18 years of age. I grew up in Market Hill in South Armagh, just a few miles from the border, and a particularly bad uh, area in a small Protestant town. And it was challenging, and I know I have experienced, I grew up in that town throughout the 80s and the early 90s before leaving to come up to South Belfast in 1998, which of course coincided with the Belfast Agreement. The Belfast Agreement, as I, I mentioned, has been referenced a number of times already tonight, but it is increasingly peppering the debate around what the British government should and shouldn't do and what the British government must and must not do. And I think it is important just to very, very briefly to reference some of those issues. And I say this in the context, as I've outlined, that not only am I opposed to hard border, but it makes no political sense for unionism to support the reinstatement of a hard border. However, there has been talk about border infrastructure, but the Belfast Agreement does not guarantee or agree any commitment in relation to hard infrastructure on the Northern Ireland-Ireland border. I don't say that to be controversial. I say that as a fact. It is a simple statement of fact. There is no mention of border infrastructure in the agreement. And there are some who argue, though it is not specifically mentioned, it is in the spirit of the agreement. And many of those who have argued this point reference the all-island economy or the all-Ireland economy. But again, factually, there is no mention in the Belfast Good Friday Agreement of all Ireland or all Ireland economy or economic cooperation. Economic cooperation is not one of the specified 12 areas of North-South cooperation. So therefore, if we are being honest to the letter and spirit of the St Andrews and Belfast agreements, the limited and specific nature of the areas of cooperation is of critical importance. And I say that not to be difficult because I see the massive benefits for us to cooperate. I think through the last 10 years, the record of the Democratic Unionist Party in working across government with our colleagues in the Republic of Ireland in relation to economic and other matters not covered by those 12 specified areas has been a good one. 
But if people are trying to deploy the Belfast and Good Friday Agreement in defence of their arguments, then it is important that we are accurate about that. In addition to that, having been involved in, in government in Northern Ireland since 2007, what I have seen at times has been the very opposite of economic cooperation. In fact, there are, the two have been jurisdictions of economic divergence, two economies very often in competition on the global stage. I have seen at first hand the deeply competitive nature as we in Northern Ireland, with the First and Deputy First Minister, with our economy minister, we went out across the world going in to pitch for the very same work, jobs, investment as the Republic of Ireland done. And I have to say very, very clearly that it is completely within the rights of the Republic of Ireland to do that. And it still is. Because economic issues are matters for those particular respective countries. The economic matters of the Republic of Ireland is a matter for the Republic of Ireland. But economic matters and decisions, including the decision to leave the European Union, is very clearly a matter for the United Kingdom. And I want to reference that because I think these ideas and issues have become conflated. And I want to present that for people to think about those particular nuances. Because one thing is very, very clear. When all of this is over, we will still have to live together, side by side, Ireland and Northern Ireland. And what is incredibly important in all of that is around the respect and relationships. To me, that is at the very heart of the Belfast and St Andrews agreements. And yet, over the course of the last number of years, in, in the last number of months, in the last number of weeks, those relationships have become fractured. And part of that fracturing is around a sense that people are overstepping, that there's interference, that people want to stop other people, their partners, their neighbours, from making decisions that they can rightfully make. I don't want to labour that point in too much detail, but I do want to touch on the issue of negotiation, because I think the experience that we have in relation to the Belfast Agreement and the St Andrews Agreement, and I, I took part and I was very much part of the negotiating teams for the DUP across a, a range of, of different uh, issues and, and negotiations over the years. But one of the key things here, I think, is to take that experience and learn from that in terms of what we are going to agree as we move forward to forge this new relationship around Brexit. Peace deals and international agreements are carefully negotiated documents. If something notable is not contained within the final agreed text, it is seldom due to an oversight on the part of the respective negotiating partners. My experience of negotiations, of which we have had many, many in Northern Ireland, is that all issues of relevance are raised, each issue discussed, at times painfully in excruciating uh, detail. And I know when I look over to uh, another of the, the old special advisor team where we have sat through many, many nights negotiating painfully, line by line, those agreements uh, and negotiations. The language of commitment or agreement Intention or aspiration are as carefully considered as legislative drafting. Of course, this does not mean that at times some things are overlooked. However, all substantial issues contained or not contained represent a careful negotiated balance. The true spirit of the agreement and the true spirit of these agreements is the utmost respect for that which made it through that process respect for the detail, and respect for the boundaries and limits of that agreement. Hence, the relevance of the points raised in relation to the agreement above. It is unfair on the parties. It is disingenuous to read into an agreement that which is not there. But we must accept that, and in building relationships, move on to forge new agreements in the interests of us all. I was surprised over the course of the last year to see this apparent disregard in the very carefully negotiated stranded approach. I'm sure most of you, if you're here on a Monday night listening to us speaking, you must be very much engaged in, in politics. So I know that most of you will, will, of course, be very familiar with what is colloquially referred to as the stranded approach of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. But that stranded approach was not a barrier to engagement with the Republic of Ireland. 
And over the years, in my experience since 2007, it has not been a barrier. Instead, it has been an enabler. That approach where we agreed what issues uh, were uh, right and proper for the uh, Republic of Ireland to comment on, and those issues which were entirely matters internal to the United Kingdom. The baskets of issues under the strands became the enabler for the confidence of unionism to engage with the leadership and the politicians and the government of the Republic of Ireland. And over the last number of, of months in particular, there does seem to have been an overstep about what is or is not appropriate for that. I have been surprised by that. Perhaps the, the leadership uh, in Ireland does not understand the significance of that as an enabler, or they are perhaps deciding to disregard that. But again, I come back to a fundamental point. When all of this is over, we will still be neighbours. We will still have to, and we should want to work together. And it is important that our relationships are maintained throughout that. I don't want to talk for particularly long. I just want to reference a couple of points that have been raised here already today. The opposition of the Democratic Unionist Party to the backstop is not to do with uh, some form of dogmatic uh, approach that there should be no differences or divergence across the United Kingdom. But what it is about is a very strong position to say that no person, body, government outside of the United Kingdom has the right to interfere so fundamentally with an issue such as the internal market of the United Kingdom. Northern Ireland does four times more trade with Great Britain than it does with the Republic of Ireland. That is not to say that we don't want trade to continue. Of course we do on the island of Ireland. But to move the issues around uh, potential regulatory divergence, issues about the EU manning of a European customs or single marker border to the uh, IRC makes no economic sense. And it is absolutely fun. We've heard here that it's not a constitutional issue. As a unionist, to me, this is an absolutely fundamental constitutional issue. And under the Belfast Agreement and the Stranded Approach, under what was agreed, there is no right for anyone to intervene with that sovereign issue of the United Kingdom. It is fundamental and it is constitutional. In relation to the backstop, I do not believe that there will be a backstop agreed which will see Northern Ireland uh, being severed from the internal market of the United Kingdom. That means, and this is based, I, I believe, on firm foundations, because the Prime Minister said this clearly, the Labour Party, right across the House of Commons, Northern Ireland will not remain within the customs union and the single market unless the entire of the United Kingdom does. And I'm, I'm throwing that out there as my observation of what I think will happen. Because if that is a certain position, then everything else must flow from that. The title of this uh, discussion today is in relation to whether or not we will return to the borders of the past. My view is that, no, it is not inevitable. It can be avoided. But the backstop is never going to be able to avoid that. And no deal will not be able to do that. The only thing that will do that, the only thing that can do that, is a negotiated agreement which looks and examines the three issues. Pertaining to that, I think it's important to ask ourselves an important question around uh, border checks. Why are there border checks? What is it that necessitates border checks? And I think to that end, really, uh, and with the International Trade Committee, I've had the privilege to, to go around a number of different countries to look at borders. And three things um, jump out in terms of necessitating border checks. Firstly, tariffs and customs. Secondly, uh, in relation to standards and quality. And thirdly, in relation to crime and smuggling. And I think the question that we need to ask ourselves is that if those are the three areas which necessitate checks, then what level of risk or what can we do to ensure that there is no necessity on any of those three areas? And that is why I said that the only way that this can be dealt with is through a negotiated agreement between the EU and the UK. And I believe when looking at th those three issues that it is absolutely possible to get that agreement. We need to get on with it. We must look at those issues. We must prevent a, a, a scenario which will not suit 
either the Republic of Ireland or ourselves. When I thought about the title right through the last number of years, and I've spoken at many things, I've always been absolutely firm that there will not be a hard border on the island of Ireland, not just as a statement of intention, but as a statement of, of what I, I believe will happen. But I have to say, I don't think we have ever been in a position where a no deal is more likely. And that should frighten us all. And that is due to, in my view, external pressures around backstops and discussions about what if it all goes wrong. We are running out of time. And time is the biggest risk in relation to this. We need to get on, get talking about the substance, and deal with all three of those uh, issues. I'm very conscious that I've completely lost the train of the speech that I was intending to give. But I do want to just conclude by just a couple of quick observations about those uh, three issues. Um, currently, we assess the risk on the current level of crime and excise duty across the border. As indicated, we have differentials. We have differentials on the island of Ireland. But what the no border that we have at the moment demonstrates is that just because we have differences doesn't mean that we have to have a hard uh, border. Most trade experts, so turning to the first one in relation to tariffs and customs, most trade expert, experts across the world, setting aside what the President of the United States is currently discussing in terms of some of the tariffs, but most uh, trade experts are very clear that tariffs in terms of trade deals are a thing of the past that tariffs should not uh, feature in terms of an agreement if we can get an agreement. In relation to customs issues, uh, there's no reason why these would be, if they are an issue, to be processed or checked at the border. It would not work here and it would not work in Dover. It is unnecessary. Not only should arrangements be dealt with in the trade deal uh, to minimise any variances or, or issues for business, but utilising pre-authorisations, online and electronic filing, the use of electronic and data tagging to physical shipments and consignments, and trusted trading arrangements can all be used to further minimise that, if indeed there is anything to minimise. But that is why we have to get on and talk about the trade deal, because we want to minimise or eliminate those insofar as we can, and I believe that we can. And make, more, make no mistake, the European Union does not require anywhere near 100% checks. We know this because we currently operate EU customs border and single market borders. I spoke to a large company importing sugar from Colombia. So in importing sugar from a regulatorily divergent third party under WTO rules. Less than 1%, 0.1% of their consignments are checked. And how less so are those checks necessary? Because remember this, and with this I will, will close, uh, that the United Kingdom, on day one of Brexit, will be 100% fully regulatorily aligned with the European Union. If divergence happens, and that will be subject to whatever the trade deal will be, it will happen over a course of time by decisions made in the House of Commons. But this is not a cliff face. We will be 100% regulatorily aligned to the standards and qualities of the European Union the day after Brexit and for some considerable time. My party leader, when speaking to um, a, an event last year, referenced around the fact that Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland are like two semi-detached houses. She said that the houses may look the same on the outside, but inside they are very different. But regardless of the internal decorations, we are tied together and part of the same neighbourhood. And what happens on one side of the fence inevitably has an impact on the other. And we fully recognise that. As I've outlined in this speech, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland are economic competitors. But at the same time, success for one can mean success for the other. By way of example, any border in the Irish Sea would not only have economically it would be economically catastrophic for, for Northern Ireland, but also have significant economic downsides for the Republic of Ireland. It is in all of our interests, not just to move the problems, but to deal with them. Just as two houses have their own identities, so do we. And after Brexit, both countries will not be members of the European Union, but we will still be neighbours. For my part, I want to see us having a good relationship 
But to do so, we can't allow the battle for sound bites to cloud over the painstaking agreements, the relationships and the rules of engagement that we have already reached. The North-South East-West relationship is much greater, in my view, than our membership of the European Union. Thank you.